everyone, this is Austin Culp. And Greg Gaskin. From Life, Love, and Food of Fi. Today we have hedge fund manager VJ Kailash with us. VJ, Welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Really excited to be here. I uh, love the episodes and love seeing what you guys are doing with the fire community and just creating a great collaborative environment for everyone to learn from and benefit from. So thank you for the invite to the show. You're way too kind. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love having new guests on all the time. Um, so tell us what you've been up to recently, Mr. Kailash. Yeah, and you know you could call me VJ. That's that's totally fine, Mister Culp. But I uh, <laughs> so recently, you know, I, as you know, I uh, left my employer of five years and I start up a hedge fund to trade options. My background's been in investment management, so just combining my professional expertise with my entrepreneurial passion, and decided to start my own fund, and uh, that's what I'm doing right now. So in the process of doing that creating a bunch of educational content just to teach people about options. And I think that's what the conversation today is, is about, just to kind of explain what options are, how people can benefit from them, or at least understand enough to know what to Google to learn about it. I think that's kind of what my goal is, to understand some key buzzwords or key terms so you know exactly what to Google. Perfect. Nice. So would starting a hedge fund to trade options be similar to like, what like Global X does with their like, like a covered call like fund? Yeah, so it's it's similar but not quite the same. So those funds are all publicly traded, as in you, me, Austin, anyone can just yeah. go buy the taker and invest in it. But the problem with those funds, or I wouldn't say it's a problem, it's just a different type of fund altogether. It's very passively managed, and so it just follows a certain criteria of rules, and then. Uh, your returns are basically that of what are happens with the criteria. As for my fund, it's actively managed. And it, so I, I know we talk about this in the fire community when it comes to active versus passive, right? Index funds are the way to go. You, you buy all 500 companies of the S&P 500, walk away, you're going to do better than people who pick individual stocks. However, with this strategy, because it's derivatives, they're, they're a completely different asset class. Active management does tend to outperform passive strategies compared to buying and holding the S&P 500. So they're two different, uh, I guess, asset classes to just even consider. So it's similar to QILD, but it's very different in the way it's managed. And so different results, uh, different risk factors, and just, I, I think my, in my opinions, it's it's better to not do the QILD. Out of, out of curiosity, <laughs> you mentioned that, that actively managed funds do better than passive in that asset class. But usually, not always. Not but always. It has potential to outperform. Yeah. Okay. So, by usually, how much does actively managed funds usually outperform passive managed funds in that asset class? So, within options, it's very difficult to tell just because these hedge funds are private instruments, as in they don't have to publicly disclose almost anything. So, if you're not an actual investor, you don't know how well this fund is actually performed to compare it usually, but you know, there's always different funds that post publicly. And uh, when they do do that, you could see, Hey, they actually outperformed or, Oh, they didn't do as well. But uh, usually it's very difficult to compare apples to apples. What was your passion for starting a hedge fund? Dude, great question. So uh, my first passion was entrepreneurship. I, w I was an entrepreneur since I guess as early as the eighth grade. What I did was I sold Mountain Dew out of my locker. And so basically there was this, um, uh, last auction and someone was auctioning off a Mountain Dew can for $5. And I'm like, that's insane. So what I did was I uh, went to a gas station right after school. I bought a 12 pack and I tried to sell it and I was able to sell all 12 cans for a dollar each. And that's when I realized you don't need a job to make money. So then since then I was always finding ways to make money, such as teaching guitars or drums. Uh, I started renting out some cars. And recently, as you know, Austin, I've been doing Airbnb where I house hack, live in one room, rent out the other rooms. And with that, I was able to make enough income to basically save 100% of my paycheck so I could eventually leave my job so I could focus on, uh, I guess, the, the, my next business venture, which is this hedge fund. Now, that's one side of it. And the other side is I just love trading in the capital markets. I've been doing this for over six years. And, you know, initially, any good trader has that has that initial spike of, wow, I'm so good. And then that initial, wow, I lost a ton of money because I have no idea what I'm doing. And I luckily went through that in college and I, I borrowed $5,000 from my parents 
and I lost $3,000 almost immediately. And I'm like, I have almost no idea what I'm doing. So then I put everything on the back burner, try to learn options trading, went through a lot of, I, I guess, emotional, uh, not necessarily trauma, but it was just like one day making a lot of money, one day losing a lot. And I'm like, there's mm -hmm. gotta be a better way. And then I learned a different strategy is what, and then I've been doing that consistently for the last three years. And that's what the strategy is that we focus on at my fund. And so combining that and my entrepreneurial passion, and here we are with the hedge fund. Nice. So getting, so let's get into the options trading, right? Yeah. What are options? Yeah, it's uh, from a simple standpoint, an yeah. option is basically just a financial contract. So, you know, any contract, it just has one person obligated to do something else. Another person has a right to, or has certain rights. And so there are two types of options. There's something called a call option and something called a put option, P-U-T. So do this with your your hand right here. It's, it's like a phone. Pretend you have a phone, you okay. call up your friend, and then after you're done with the call, you put down the phone. So if you think a stock is gonna go up, you would buy a call option because you call up your friend. If you think a stock is gonna go down, you would buy a put option you put down the phone. This is an actual advice. This is to keep the differences between calls and puts kind of uh, straight in your head. And so a call option, what it does, remember there's two options, call option and put option. A call option gives you the right, but not the obligation to buy 100 shares of a stock at a certain price on or before an expiration date. And so an example of that is, uh, Greg, do you own a home? Yes, I do. You do. Okay. So at, because I know Austin does, that's why I didn't ask, but when you buy a house, you know, the due diligence fee that you pay, uh, yes. you're kind of like paying upfront fee and during that period, you can bring in an inspector, make sure there's no plumbing issues or, you know, there's nothing major going on. Mm -hmm. Basically when you pay that due diligence fee, that's kind of like a call option. You paid for the right, but not the obligation to buy that house at a specific price on or before the expiration date, which is the due diligence period. And so let's say you find major electrical issues or something major is going on with the foundation. You don't want to go through with that. You could back away from that contract. And what happens is you just end up losing that due diligence fee. But if you do end up going through with it, you have the right to buy that house and the seller of the house is obligated to sell it to you because they collected that fee. Oh. That makes sense. So that's all a call option is, yeah. except you take that from real estate and then you compare it to a stock. When you buy a call option, you have the right to buy a stock at a certain price on or before an expiration date. So let, let me use an example. Let's say right now a stock's at $100 and you think in 30 days, some big events coming out and you think the stock's going to trade at $120, but you have no idea. So you don't want to put in all your money. So what you could do is you can go into the market and buy something called a call option with a strike price of let's say $105. So the strike price is a price which you have the right to buy the stock at. And so in 30 days, let's say the market shoots way up and now the stock's trading at 120, like you predicted, because you bought the contract, you have the right to buy 100 shares at $105, even though it's trading at 120. And so you could buy the stock at 105 and then you could sell it in the open market and just make a, almost a $15 profit minus the, the premium that you paid for that right and the commissions, if that makes sense. And so uh, let's just say the premium you pay for this is $2, right? So in 30 days, when the contract expires, the stock's trading at 120, mm -hmm. but you had the right to buy it right at 105, but you paid $2 for that right. And so basically your cost to buy the stock was 107, but you could sell it in the market for 120 and you just made $13 profit. But okay. what happens is let's say the stock is below $105. You actually just end up losing that $2 premium because remember that contract, which you bought, it gave you the right to buy the stock at $105. And there's no reason you would buy it at 105 if it's trading at only 103, right? So you would just buy in the yeah. open market. So that contract you bought actually just expires worthless. So that's all options are just gives you the right to buy a stock at a certain price on or before an expiration date. 
And so that is okay. the one type of option, but we'll take a break before we go into put options. Any uh, <laughs> questions on that? I just threw a bunch of information at you guys. Yeah, so out of curiosity, <clears throat> um, for those who might be looking to get into options trading or um, going down that route with call and put options, um, what resources would you recommend about letting new investors learn about options for the first time? Absolutely. Uh, great question. So I've been putting out a bunch of content on my own website, vjkailash.com. And on that website, I go through the very basics of call options and put options. And I'm going to go through a bunch of different strategies you can use in your own portfolio once you understand how they work. So just uh, head over to vjkailash.com, first name, last name, and uh, have a podcast, which is going to be specializing in uh, entrepreneurship, self-improvement, but also investing in options. And uh, also have a bunch of articles out there which can help you learn about options as well. Perfect. Now, are there any specific brokerages that restrict options trading or don't do it? Most brokerages allow it, but you have to ask for specific permissions. And so let's say you use Fidelity. You, d you don't naturally just get options trading. You have to go apply for options and you have to put in information. How long have you been trading options? What's your expertise level? And based on that they will either approve or deny you. The only reason you get denied is if you're trying to do extremely risky things on your application, but you have zero experience, they're going to say, yeah, we're not going to let you do this. Or they're going to give you very limited access to options. So essentially it's like, you know, having like training wheels on your... Exactly. Well, training wheels, but you can still lose a lot of money if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So we talked about buying the options. What about the sell side, how can you lose money selling options or how does it work? Yeah. So like in every market, there's always a buyer and there's always a seller. And so what I talked about, like you said, Greg was the buying side, you buy a call option, you end up paying a premium. What happens is the person you paid the premium to, they're the ones who sold it. And so there's a lot of strategies, which can expose you to a lot of risk, but the strategies which I follow are a lot safer actually, and just it's used to produce income, ongoing income. So there's a strategy using call options called a covered call. Have you heard of that or are you familiar with the covered call strategy? I've heard of it, but not really an, an expert okay. on what that well, actually think of, So think of, uh, I guess the example, which we had before, let's say stocks at $100. I own 100 shares of this stock. What I wanna do is I wanna collect income on the stock. So I would sell a call option at $105 strike price. Remember the previous example, someone was buying mm. this, the option. I'm selling it to them. And for that, I get to collect a $2 premium. The only thing is that if the stock goes above the $105, I become obligated to sell the stock at the $105. Remember, I'm the one selling the house. And so if the buyer wants to buy the house, I'm obligated to sell it to them. But I, gotta, I got to get paid the due diligence fee. And so in essence, if I own a stock and I'm comfortable selling it at a profit, remember it's at 105 right now, but I want to sell it at 105. Sorry, it's at 100 right now and I want to sell it at 105. I could collect income by selling a call option against the 100 shares I have. And so when I do this, I get to collect income, lower my cost basis, reduce volatility, reduce my risk. And, the, and worst case or best case, whatever happens if the market goes up, I become obligated to sell it at a profit. But if the market goes down, I would have still done better than someone who had just bought the stock and who had not sold the call option because I at least got to collect the income. They did not get to collect mm -hmm. the income. So no matter what happens with the call option, by doing the strategy, you basically make money, but just know your maximum profit is, or your profit is defined and it is capped. Because if the stock shoots up to, let's say $300, you still had to sell it at $105. And so that is the risk. You miss out on the gain. But the probability of it shooting up from 100 to 330 days or how much ever it is, <laughs> yeah. right? you, have, you have to do the math and, and options are priced accordingly based on implied volatility and how the market believes the stock's going to change. Okay, thanks. Good information to know. Yeah. Is there... Is there any type of investor you would not recommend doing option trading for? It's not necessarily the type of investor. I think it's about the type 
of education you have regarding options trading before getting started? I think there's a type of option trading strategy that would work with any type of investor, but you just need to make sure you're educated enough to understand what type of investor you are and what your goals are and which option strategy meets those goals. So I, I, I think it can be used for anyone. And that's the beauty of it. You can make money up bear markets, bull markets, neutral markets. Um, you could speculate with it. You can just use it to make income. No matter what, there's, there's a strategy for anyone, but you just have to learn it first. Gotcha. So we talked about the call side options. Now you want to get into the put options? Dude, great question. I, uh, I love puts. They're actually, uh, they're my favorite. And th this is why think of, so put options, remember back to our example, the phone you call up as in you buy a call option. If you think the stock's going to go up because it gives you the right to buy the stock put down, you would buy a put option. If you think the stock's going to go down because the put option gives you the right, but not the obligation to sell 100 shares of a stock call option gives you the right to buy 100 shares. A put option gives you the right to sell 100 shares of stock. So a put option in essence is basically just insurance on a stock. So going back to our example, let's say stocks at hundred dollars, you could buy a put option at $95 strike price. And so you're basically buying insurance. If the stock stays above 95, all that means is that there's no insurance claim as in, uh, the market did not crash. But if the market does go down below 95, you have the right to sell it at 95. So let's say you, you buy a put option on a stock. It goes down to $70 because you bought the put option. You had the right to sell it at 95, even though it's trading at 70 right now. So in essence a put options, is like insurance and think of car insurance. Every six months you pay your insurance premium. Best case, you don't crash your car. But if you do crash your car, you, the insurance company basically buys a car from you. That's exactly what's happening here with put options. You, you're buying insurance on a stock. If the stock goes down, the insurance company basically buys the stock from you at a lower price and you basically get coverage. But if the market does not go down, you just end up losing your premium. And so what I do, uh, the thing about the seller side is I am the insurance company. That's what my fund does. We sell insurance on stocks we want to own. So basically no matter what happens in the market, we make money. Think of this. I want to own, uh, let's say QQQ, NASDAQ 100, you know, very heavy in tech stocks. I can buy it right now in the market, or I can sell insurance on QQQ. So if the QQQ does not drop, I get to make about 20% a year of just income from the insurance premiums. But if it does crash, I become obligated to buy it at a lower price, but I wanted to own this this ETF anyways. So no matter what happens, either I make 20% if the market does not crash, or I become obligated to buy it at a lower price, which is exactly what most people want to do. You want to buy these high quality companies at lower prices. And because I'm a long-term mm -hmm. investor, after it drops, I just wait, hold it, and then I let it basically go back up in price over a few years. And so that's where I love put options. Basically it's insurance letting me buy great companies at lower prices. Is there a minimum amount you need to get started to doing options? Um, so that, it depends on what type of strategy you're trying to do. If you are selling options, you need to be able to buy 100 shares of the stock. So QQQ, for example, it's trading at 350 ish. I don't know where it is. So that means you need $35,000 for one contract to sell insurance on QQQ. Assuming you're not using margin, you're not borrowing money. If it's a cash account, you need about 35 grand. But if you're buying options, which I don't necessarily recommend, you would need to be able to pay the premium amount, which maybe comes to 800 bucks per contract or so. Uh, it really depends on, uh, there's a bunch of different factors on what, uh, how much, how options are priced. But uh, I wouldn't recommend getting started with options unless you have about 20 to $25,000. Okay. That makes sense. And in the meantime, like play with, like understand it, play with the paper trading account, understand the difference between buying and selling and learn how the platforms work. And once you get to that 25,000 or closer to 40,000, because 
I personally only do this on index funds because I'm very bullish on index funds in the very long run. Because I don't think I can take individual stocks better than how the indexes can perform. So I'm just taking that assumption out and I'm only doing this on index funds. But if you find stocks that you like that are that you can buy 100 shares of easily, then you could probably get started with selling options on them. Now, you, you mentioned a, a paper account. Like, a, I'm assuming that it's like a... Could you explain that? Like, is there like a way for investors to buy options without their real money or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So paper trading counts like just fake money as in the broker gives you a fake $100,000. It's not your money. It's just kind of like, hey, this is hypothetical money. Enjoy. And with that, you could buy and sell, but it's not real money. No trades are actually being executed. It's more just for you to track your own performance and for you to understand it a little bit more. But the real learning happens when you risk real money, because that way you take all emotions or your emotions actually do weigh heavily when you're a trader. Now, do a lot of the big brokerages have this or only certain ones have that capability? The paper trading? Yes. Uh, gosh, I know uh, Thinkorswim by TD Ameritrade has it. I don't personally use it. I've never use paper trading other than outside of college, because I think real learning happens when you risk real money. Uh, but if you really want to learn it, I think you need to risk real money. In my opinion, that's how I roll. But if you just want to try a hypothetical strategy, it might it might make sense to do it. But I, I think real money is where you see how your performance actually is. Okay. Because there's one yeah. thing trading on theory, another thing trading when your emotions are attached. And this is why 99% of traders are not successful because they let emotions come in. The moment your emotions come in, you're going to be an unprofitable trader. Like you might, you might win every now and then, but you just end up gambling. You start doing something called revenge trading where market drops or it goes against you. And then you try to double up on your position size to try to make back your gains, but you just end up losing it more. And emotions are extremely dangerous when it comes to trading. So you said you trade mostly on index funds. Now, are there, can you do it on any index funds or do only certain ones, I guess, allow you the capability to trade options on them? Yeah. So you can actually do it on almost most stocks. Any stock that, uh, I, I'd say a lot of stocks have options capabilities of very small companies do not necessarily have options, but any of the big companies on the S&P 500, most of them do have options. So if you are very bullish on just Apple. You could trade options just on Apple. You can do it just on Amazon. But remember, Amazon, um, the, the, I don't know what the price is. It's a couple thousand dollars. So you need, you, you need, you need quite a lot of money just for one contract yeah. if you're trying to sell options. And so uh, you could find stocks that are maybe uh, 20 to 30 bucks and you only need two to three grand for one contract. And I think that's a great place to get started. But just know if that company it's doing accounting fraud or just has a lot of, has bad earnings. Your, your position size is so concentrated where you have to figure out whether you're okay holding that company for the long run. So it's very important to only sell options on stocks and securities. You are very bullish on in the long run where you're okay with it dropping 20 to 30% at rather than, Oh crap, I should have not bought this company. So it's basically just like an alternative to buying a stock. So you find a company you want to buy, an alternative is instead of just buying it, you would sell a put option. With running your own hedge fund, what does a normal day, an average day in, in your life look like? So, you know, just uh, just started this a few weeks ago, I guess about a month ago. It's been very uh, crazy, but usually we wake up around 5.30, meditate, go to the gym, come back, get a clear mind, and then start doing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of creating a website, starting a podcast, creating articles, doing outreach to investors and uh, prospective clients. But also around 10 a.m. is when I start trading usually. So I've usually, just because with this strategy, it's very automated. I understand I've been doing it for six years. I place a trade and I kind of walk away until I get a notification on my phone saying I need to do another action. And this is where good traders get separated from bad traders because I'm not using emotion. I'm not watching the screen. I don't know what's happening in the market. I don't care what happens in the market, but I know it will go wrong if I start looking at what's happening in the market. So you place a trade, you get notifications, you just kind of close the screen, walk away. And then my phone reminds me or tells me, hey, this trade's been executed or QQQ has dropped 4%. Uh, and then I can basically decide what to do at that time. So that way I'm not really in front of my computer for trading as much 
it's a lot of uh, client investor outreach. Okay. And a lot of education as well. Like you two are extremely brilliant. You're in the fire community, you understand money significantly more than most other people, yet you're not familiar with options because it's something that a lot of people think are scary, right? It has a bad rep because yeah. a lot of people associate options with gambling and it is gambling if you're buying options and you don't know what you're doing, as in you're buying lottery tickets. Yeah, every now and then there's huge wins and people only post about their wins, but the 99% of people who lost money don't post. What I am, I am the casino and I am the insurance company where I consistently collect income rather than, hey, I made it big every now and then. It's like, yeah, I may get some drawdowns every now and then, but my drawdowns, the worst case is I buy stock, which I want to own anyways. That's my biggest drawdown. And other, like if the market doesn't do anything, I just get to collect 20% a year of income. Yeah, I mean, nice. To, to me, options is definitely a, uh, it's not something I'm, I'm very familiar with. And, you know, like a majority of people in the fire community, it's, I am the VTSAX and, and chill. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think that's a great place to get started. Once you get to 100 shares of a certain index fund, let's say you do VTI or you switch over to SPY. Uh, SPY, I don't know, it's like 400-ish. So you need about 40 grand or so to buy 100 shares. I would recommend looking into selling call options against your index fund. When you sell a call option, remember you're collecting income. If the market goes down, you you will outperform anyone who owns the same stock. Just because it went down, you gotta collect the income, remember? But if it goes up past a certain amount, you are not gonna perform as well as someone who had just held it. But regardless, by selling a call option, you would have lowered the volatility in your portfolio just because you collected a little income cash, actual cash to cushion uh, no matter what's happening. So you can lower your volatility. So as you're getting closer and closer to retirement or getting to that uh, withdrawal stage of your FIRE journey, you could start allocating a portion of your portfolio to call options so you can collect income on the stock. And then if the market goes up, you, had to, you were obligated to sell the stock, which you wanted to do anyways, because you needed that cash. That makes and sense. Your portfolio, right? Yeah, and and you know the, yeah. there are many successful uh, hedge funds out there who focus solely on options. So obviously it, it works, right? Like, yeah. Otherwise they wouldn't be in business. Exactly right. No, it absolutely works. And uh, my entire retirement accounts in this, my Roth IRA, my four hundred one k, once I transferred from my previous employer, I actually uh, got a key lock on this property and did a cash out refinance on my other property. So I'm all in and I'm using all those funds for this specific strategy. That's how confident I am in it. So, so, so you're wow. using all your own money to, to get started. Uh, yeah. And that's how confident I am in it. As in, no one's telling me to do it. It's, it just makes more sense for my lifestyle, my strategy. And I'm like, cool, I'm already doing this with a bunch of my own money. I'm okay bringing investors on. If not, doesn't matter. People are missing out. That's how I view it. Yeah. How, how do you find investors? So going to networking events, and uh, that's actually the, I guess, purpose of this podcast, which I'm starting just to bring on other entrepreneurs, other investors, other people who've quote unquote made it in a professional and financial sense, and just kind of learn their story to understand what they're doing. So then I could share it with my audience. And I'm going from a long-term perspective, just the giving perspective. I'm not trying to make any sales. It's purely, uh, hey, you have great information. Let me share it with my community and let's just grow as a community together. And then those who want to invest, they're more than welcome to, but by no means am I trying to force anyone to do anything because I'm perfectly fine just managing my own money and with the few investors I have. But as if people want to invest, they're more than welcome to. What's like a minimum investment to get started that you have to make? Yeah, so this is uh, getting a little bit more into the private offering stuff, which I can't really talk about on this. But legally, I can only raise capital from someone who has at least $2.2 million in net worth, excluding their primary residence. And then from there, you know, just have a conversation, build a substantive pre existing relationship before I can make an offer. But that's not the minimum investment. The minimum investment is a lot less than that. But just for, to, for me, take you on as a client, you need to have $2.2 million in net worth. All right, nice. So, uh, you mentioned that you had your, like your Roth funds and your transferring your four hundred one k to it. Uh, would you recommend people just try options trading 
in a retirement account or an after-tax brokerage account? I'd recommend starting with a regular brokerage account, taxable brokerage account, just because you can deduct your losses. When you get started trading a new strategy and you don't understand it, you need to be able to write off your, your losses because I can guarantee you will have losses when you're just getting started. But once you understand your strategy and you know you don't have as many losses, it's good to transfer more into a, uh, a retirement account because you're not paying any taxes. The only problem with this strategy is that it's very tax inefficient. Every contract I sell, it's taxed as short-term capital gains, which is the same as your ordinary income. But the only difference is it costs me five minutes of my life to make that trade rather than working eight hours a day in the, in the tax realm, right? It's like, if I'm making that much money with five minutes of my day, rather than working in nine to five, I'm happy to pay the taxes, but that's how I view it. It really depends on, uh, I guess, other perspectives. So uh, there are other strategies that are more tax favorable, which I personally haven't gotten into myself, but you can trade options on something called futures, which is another type of derivative. So it's actually second degree derivative trading, and that's taxed 60% long-term, 40% short-term. So by doing this, you're actually getting better tax treatment overall, but it uh, doesn't mean you should necessarily, just, just because, um, it, like just like anything you do, you need to learn it first, practice it, and then once you feel comfortable, then you can go all in. You know, what, what would be the best way for people to get, get in contact with you if they have questions about options trading? Absolutely. And I know this was a lot of stuff I just kind of threw up on you guys. So, you know, I appreciate <laughs> you, uh, you know, following along on this journey. Um, the best place to get in contact with me is going to vjkailash.com. My first name, last name.com has all my social medias out there. If you want to learn about the options, I posted a very... Uh, an introductory, I guess, article on there. So you can read it, understand it, reach out to me on social media for uh, any questions, more than happy to jump on a call. And I view it as, I, I, I think the FIRE community especially can benefit a lot from options just because like you said, VTS, VTSAX and chill has been kind of the mantra. And I think it's a fantastic place to get started. But with a little bit more slight active management, you can outperform uh, VTSAX significantly over the few decades you're going to be doing the strategy it just takes just a little bit more education selling a few more call options once you understand it collect that income use that to buy more shares and you're going to do significantly mm -hmm. better than just waiting for dividends to come in dividends honestly it's it's something but really like it hurts me how little it is and how much people care about dividends here you can literally <laughs> create your own dividend like let me uh give you an example i uh sold call options on iwm and because of the amount of premiums I was collecting, and IWM was trading around 230-ish at this time, 220, 230, the number of the amount of premium I collected, I was able to buy five extra shares of IWM all within just a few months. That's over a thousand dollars of income I'm collecting on a twenty-two thousand dollar investment, which I would have made anyways. IWM again, so it's a Russell two thousand, it's a small cap index. Using that much money I made, I was able to buy five extra shares. And now when the market goes mm -hmm. up, I could continue selling more call options, collect more income, buy more shares. Now compare that to someone who had just bought the hundred shares of IWM and just kind of walked away for life. Who's going to do better? Someone who has five extra shares in just a few months or someone who just kept that hundred. Right. And it's a, yeah. that, that's how I view it. So you want to do this on companies and securities, which are very bullish on in the long run, which is, for example, BTSAX or BTI, VOOs, SPY, QQQ, all these index funds. And you're just collecting more income outside the dividends in addition to dividends. And they could buy more shares. Okay. Nice. That's a good that's a good point. Especially I feel like in a time when the market drops, I feel like it could be very lucrative then as well. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Well I'll um, we'll go ahead and post BJ Kailash's link to his website along with his social media in order for you guys to reach out and ask me questions. And yeah, BJ, it's been a pleasure. Um, thanks for joining us. Of course, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. And uh, of course, you guys reach out if you have any questions about options or just want to say, hey, uh, click the link and uh, hope to hear from you soon. Thanks for watching. Absolutely. Well, this has been another episode of Life, Love, and Pursuit of Fi with Austin Culp.
and Greg Gaskin. And thank you so much, and we look forward to speaking with you in the future. Thank you.